Hi, Quinn. This is Evelyn, testing, testing. For joining us for today's webinar, we have quite a few folks who uh, RSVP that they would join us, and I would like to just take three additional minutes so that everyone has sufficient time to log in. So hang in there with us, and in three minutes, we will get everything started. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Evelyn Mantilla. I'm going to be your moderator for today, and uh, we're going to get started with today's webinar. I want to give you a couple of housekeeping items first. Uh, participants are automatically muted once logged in. Please keep your audio muted for the duration of the webinar. And secondly, very important, questions will be reserved for the end of the webinar. Please type any questions that you may have into the chat box and, and the presenter and myself will make sure that we answer them during the Q&A time. So first of all, let me say thank you for joining us today on behalf of Access Health Connecticut. Today's uh, webinar focused on the social determinants of health is going to be presented by Dr. Takesha Everett from Health Equity Solutions. Uh, Takesha is the Executive Director of Health Equity Solutions and someone that we look upon uh, very highly in terms of helping our communities understand the issues of health equity and in specific uh, how the social determinants of health can affect everyone. Mm -hmm. So we are delighted to have her. We're delighted to have the participation and partnership with Health Equity Solution. So good afternoon, Takesha. Good afternoon. May I say your first name like that? That's wonderful. Awesome, wonderful. We are going to be running through the deck, the PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to hand it over to her, but I will help facilitate the conversation as we go along. So don't forget, if you have questions along the way, type them in the chat box and we will attend to those toward the end. So today, Access Health Connecticut's webinar is about the social determinants of health. We will explore um, the, the meaning of social determinants of health, but we also want you to know our partner, Health Equity Solutions. So Takesha, let me hand it over to you, talk about your vision and mission. Thank you so much, Evelyn. So welcome to the webinar, and as already explained, I'm Takesha Everett, the Executive Director of Health Equity Solutions. Health Equity Solutions is a 501c3 nonprofit that has a statewide focus on making sure that every Connecticut resident is able to obtain their optimal health regardless of race, ethnicity, or socioeconomic status. While we're located in Hartford, we do support work in different cities and towns across Connecticut, and that work looks like our mission, which says that we are here to promote policies, programs, and practices that will result in equitable health. It's important that we know when we talk about policies, programs, and practices, that means both at an institutional level, but also at a state and local level. We look for our opportunities to collaborate with our partners um, and our approach to achieve health equity in Connecticut. This slide explains to you how we do this. It's through education and awareness, the main two cornerstone parts of any 501c3. And we also use our ability to influence policy through advocacy. We have partnerships across the state with a number of organizations, and everything we do is in coalition and involves deep planning for the future of our Connecticut. Today, we're going to talk a lot about social determinants of health, but before we go into that, it's very important that we set the stage and make sure we're all on the same page when it comes to a couple of definitions. So I will say this part of the webinar will feel just a little fundamental, but trust, we're going somewhere with all of this. So when we say health equity, we want to be sure that everyone understands health equity solutions is focused on ensuring all populations in Connecticut have access to optimal health. That definition of optimal health is the center of health equity. So whether you are concerned about gender, race, or socioeconomics, the part about making sure that that population gets their optimal health is critical. For Health Equity Solutions, we focus squarely and unapologetically on race and ethnicity in Connecticut. When we talk about health disparities, which are wording that I'll use in throughout the uh, webinar, 
We're specifically looking at the reduction of disease burden in partic particular communities of color and different racial groups. Health inequity goes to another level, and I won't go over it now, but I will come back to this, so keep this in mind. So here's the part that seems a little elementary, the framing and definitions. First, let's talk about health. When we think about health, not only our medical system, but often ourselves individually, we focus on health as the way of thinking strictly not being ill. Health is completely the complete and total physical, mental, and social well-being of every, of every individual and or population and community. It's not just the absence of disease and infirmity. And what we like in this diagram is we also like to show that most of us, when we think of health, focus on that 30% part here that says health behaviors. But really, when you look at this pie chart, it shows you that if we only focus on the health behavior part and the clinical care, we're missing 50% of the picture. And in fact, the most critical aspect that we see on this graph is that 40% of what drives our health is rooted in socioeconomic factors. We'll come back to that a little bit more later as well. I've already started with the definition of explaining the difference between health disparity and health inequities, but I wanna go in deeper here. You'll note that in our communications, we try to really stray away from talking about health disparity, but the two are linked. A health disparity is a difference in health status among groups and the burden of illness of one population group compared to another. We often do this as figuring out one population that we think has the best health and or the greatest level of health and compare another group to them and we look at rates of disease. So an example of a health disparity many of you I'm sure have heard is that communities of color are more likely than whites to have, to have chronic disease. Ex examples include diabetes, high blood pressure, or asthma. If you listen to that example, once again, what we've done is taken a group of people, communities of color, and compared them to a reference group, white individuals, and then we could enter a statistic about the rates of disease. There's absolutely nothing wrong looking at that viewpoint, but it misses a part of the picture and we'd like to go in deeper and talk about the health inequity. If we don't look at health inequity, which really looks beyond the what is happening to why it's happening, that's when we start to understand that there are systematic and avoidable things that are happening in our system that actually looks at and explains why we have the differences and the disparities that we see. So health inequity really goes into looking at the external conditions of the systematic, avoidable, and unjust distribution of resources that then drive up or cause our disparities in the system. Here, what we're looking at squarely and fundamentally are social determinants of health and other factors that go outside of genetics and behavioral health. Health inequities have systemic roots and are long standing and are long standing in our society. So they exist for a variety of reasons. There are structural and institutional isms, and when I say isms, again here, racism, sexism, genderism, ableism, any of the different isms that exist in our society. But it also connects that we use those isms to then talk about and then dictate the inequitable access to health care and equitable access to quality care, even if we do have health insurance or health care access, and then the inequitable opportunities that exist in our society that are rooted in education, employment, housing, food, and et cetera. For health equity solutions, as explained earlier, we really do focus on the link between race, ethnicity, health, and health care. For us, it means that we look at everything through the lens of structural racism and really talk about the way in which we have structured in our society opportunity, education, housing, jobs, justice, et cetera, and then assign value to individuals based on that, worthy or unworthy. This quote on the slide summarized is, is quoted from Dr. Kamara Jones, who is a noted physician and public health um, luminary who really designed and explains through her story about the gardener's tale. If you haven't seen it or heard it, you should look that up. And explains how we do dictate our, our distribution of resources based on an opportunity structure. You again can put in a filter about that opportunity structure around gender, how men are privileged over women, 
or around gender or, or around sexual um, orientation, how people who are heterosexual are preferred or preferenced, um, or excuse me, preferred in or given a higher value in our society than others. Here we also talk about how populations of race, um, excuse me, different populations who have different race and ethnicities are also disenfranchised in the system. So now, why does health equity matter? This is one of my favorite slides, and I will spend a little bit of time here. So many of you probably have seen this image, and I'd like to just talk a little bit about this image. Here, I'm going to do a few things. I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story and gender the individuals in the story, and then move to what this means and why we care about health equity. So here we see three boys, and for the purposes of our talk, we're going to say that these boys are the same age. We have three boys who are having an opportunity to look at the all-American game of baseball. They're just trying to get a little bit of joy in their life right now. And we all know baseball is a fun thing. So you see here there are three boxes and each of the boys are standing on the box. The tallest boy to the left can visually see every aspect of the game. And guess what? If that pitcher hits a home run, Wait a minute, you can see I don't know that baseball, I said the pitcher. If, <laughs> if a home run is hit, that kid could probably see that ball go all the way out of the stadium. But if you look at the little boy all the way to the right, he can barely see anything. And if he can see anything, he can see it through that narrow slit in the fence. This is the literal definition of equality. Each of these three boys have been given a box, the exact same resource, to look over the fence, which is a barrier to the field, to see the game. And if we translated this into health, each of them have been given the same access, those three boxes, to look into their health system or to be a part of the health system. Equality in its definition is the, equal, is the state of being equal, especially in status, rights, and opportunities. But now let's look at, look at an equitable distribution of this same picture. Here what you'll note is the, the tallest boy who could see the game from the beginning can still see the game. The boy in the middle, who ever so little could see it above, over, above, over, uh, above the fence, he's still at the same place he can see it. But the little boy all the way at the end now has two boxes it can see completely over the fence. We always like to point out here too, look how their body language has completely changed. They're really able to enjoy the game now. This is the definition of equity. Equity means that we have taken the same resources that we currently have in our system, but thought differently about how we distributed them. And this here, if we talked about health, we are now looking at how we look at the determinants of health and what resources we have. And we distribute them, distribute them differently in order to decrease the differentials in overall health. The biggest thing I'd also like to point out in this picture before we go to the next slide is note we didn't add a single new resource to this picture. The three boxes are the same three boxes from the first picture. Now, I ask everybody who's listening on this webinar to remember this picture because at the end of my talk, I'm going to come back to it because there's one piece of the story that's still missing. But let's get into a practical example about the social determinants of health as we really go in depth about those. And this is where I'm going to take you through a little bit of an activity, but it's really an example about the social determinants of health. Here's Bobby. Because I'm sitting in Hartford today, Bobby is a resident of Hartford. But you could be in Bridgeport, New London, or anywhere in Connecticut, and Bobby could be the same Bobby there with you. Bobby suffers from chronic asthma. On this slide, you'll see a bunch of different influencers that could actually be a bother to his asthma. You see here in this picture, mold, his parents, or his parent who might have had asthma, you see a manufacturing plant in the lower left side that's in the neighborhood near where Bobby lives. And the all disgusting, never wanna see cockroach. All of these things are influencers that can really hurt or harm Bobby's chronic asthma. And if any of us were our healthcare providers or work within the healthcare system, what we would immediately start to think about is what are the behavioral aspects that are linked to this? The dust that's on the floor, why is that there? And we would immediately go to a behavioral example or explanation. The mold in the bathroom and or the cockroach, we may think it's a cleanliness issue. 
his parents is a genetic issue, but it also could be do they know how to properly use the inhaler? So all of our interventions, our tactics, and our thought processes here will lead us to thinking about behavioral changing issues that need to be corrected or fixed in Bobby's life to control his chronic asthma. But when we're looking and talking about health equity and the social determinants of health, we have to force ourselves to look a little bit deeper and go beyond the first two rung, rungs you see here on this picture. You see, Bobby is still at the center, and those pictures on the previous slide, we could place in any one of these rungs. We try to talk about that highest one. For me, this highest rung of socioeconomic, cultural, and political environment is pinkish lavender. Depends on how it shows up on your screen, but that's the top one we're talking about. All of the pictures on the previous slide, except perhaps his parents having a his parents having asthma, could all fit in that socioeconomic, cultural, and political environmental slide. Let's talk about that for our section. Let's talk about that for one moment. Being in a Mac, being in an area that's near or close to having housing that's near or close to a manufacturer plant is really rooted in political political and policy decisions that are made about where we can and cannot locate housing. Where is housing affordable? What do you have access to? What jobs, employment status do you have? A lot of times we know, depending on where you live, and especially in Connecticut and the mill towns, housing was located closest to the jobs and the positions. As those opportunities leave, where do the housing go? And where are people able to leave with those opportunities? So when we think about Bobby, Bobby could possibly be living in an in a area where his asthma is not able to be successful or his asthma treatment plan isn't able to be successful, rooted and linked to things in his socioeconomic, cultural, or political environmental aspects. The big thing that I do like to say here is while this slide shows culture, we tend to not talk about culture as much because Culture then links us back to individual lifestyle often. But it's important to note that there are cultural differences and important things that also dictate how people are able to manage or not manage their asthma. So let's take this example a little further and actually get into a clear, clean definition of the social determinants of health. And I'm gonna walk through in a moment Bobby's entire story, which is very similar to my own personal story, in a slide in just a second. But let's define and get on the same page about the social determinants of health. The social determinants of health are all of the health conditions or the conditions that exist outside of the health care system or the health system that actually influence an individual's health. It's all about the conditions in which people are born, they grow, live, work, and age. In other words, where you play, where you live, and probably where you will pass on. These circumstances are shaped by the distribution of money, power, and resources at a global, national, and local level. If you leave today's webinar with nothing else, it's important to understand that even when you see a health disparity, and that's what we're talking about, there's something in the background that led all the way to that disparity being something that exists. One of the examples that I often like to give is in the town where I live, West Hartford. A lot of people don't know this about West Hartford, but really inside of the square mileage of West Hartford, there's very little fast food restaurants. And the fast food restaurants that do exist do not have drive throughs except for one, and it was really controversial to, have, controversial to get the one. And often they're located next to a healthier option. When we talk about social determinants of health, if you live in a community where ordin local ordinances are written in such a way that it makes it impossible to have drive throughs or difficult to have drive throughs and the fast food has to be located next to a healthier option, you can automatically understand why their health might be a lot more optimal than somebody in a different community where they live, where those are not the same decisions that were made. These are social determinants of health. So now I wanna walk through this slide very clearly. So this, this slide shows you all of the six domains of the social determinants of health. And I do wanna make sure that we understand, one, that each of these domains are individual, but they are also collective and they also can influence each other and be seen as a collective. So when we talk about economic stability as an influencer or determinant of health, these are the types of things we're talking about are described here in this slide. Employment, income, expenses, debt, 
medical bills and support. And I always like to start here and say, I actually think the debt and medical bills could probably be debt slash medical bills because there is something really big and should be talked about around medical debt, especially in the state of Connecticut. But when we look at economic stability, it's important to understand that our employment influences our income and our expenses and our ability to pay that influences our debt. And if we don't have health coverage or if we don't have adequate health coverage, it's really impossible for us to get away with med without having medical bills and medical debt. And all of this looks at a structure of support. For example, one of the things I'd like to highlight is I'm a first generation college student raised by a single parent. I didn't have support from that single parent to go to college. So often I had to rely on my own ability to pay for my own medical bills and anything that I needed. This is a key understanding of economic stability and how that is a determinant of health. When I talk about Bobby, Bobby is really Takesha. I grew up with chronic asthma and had to be able to, at my own adult early age in college, pay for my own inhalers. If I had an asthma attack, my own nebulizer treatment. I didn't have the support and I have very little income to do this. So you can really imagine how I had to manage my asthma on a very low, low budget and make sure that I didn't put myself in situations that would require me to have the need to go to the hospital or to have treatment. This is about economic stability and how that is a driver of health and how a lot of my health in my young teen years, <clears throat> which was so long ago, was influenced by my ability to pay for my own health care. But let's talk about neighborhood and physical environment. Redlining is a policy that happened in the early 1950s and really dictated where people of color could and could not live. So housing is a really, really big key in terms of our social determinants when it comes to health. When you look at neighborhoods, where they are, who lives there, and the history of those neighborhoods, you can understand the links between our public policy choices and decisions and then what happens in the physical environment in which people live. Housing is also linked to transportation. Today's webinar is not a long discussion about the historical influences and how we build our housing and our transportation, but let's be very clear. When you look at the flow of transportation in and out of communities and in and out of areas, it is longstanding being linked to employment and where the employment is. When we had a lot of employment in the suburbs, a lot of public transportation or transportation options were available. When it was in the local cities, the same is true. As we look at our neighborhood and physical environments and things change, transportation or lack thereof go right and hand in hand. And I will say here in our experience at Health Equity Solutions, when we talk to communities about one of the top influencers or issues they see in preening them from health equity, transportation in Connecticut is a large one. Safety is very important here as well. How safe is your neighborhood? One of my favorite examples comes from a prior work environment where we were always trying to get physicians to understand that you can't just tell people with diabetes that they need to exercise more and it's as simple as going outside of your house and walking more if you're not asking them if they have sidewalks in their communities or lights on, those, on their streets to feel safe in those walk, in, in, while they're walking. The other two issues here are parks, playgrounds, and walkability. Walkability, I just gave you an example linked to safety, but I will talk about parks here for a second. I marvel at how lovely the park system is here in our state of Connecticut. But we also need to think sometimes about where the parks are distributed and are they equally available and accessible to all communities. These are ways in which we can think about and link to when we're looking at somebody who may need to lose a little bit of weight to control their chronic disease, or just generally needs to walk more if they're an elderly person to make sure that they don't have arthritis or to control their arthritis or other issues, are we really giving them an opportunity within their local neighborhood to do so? Education is a big factor and a big link to health. And I'm not gonna go in detail on everything in this slide or everything in the section of education, but it's really important to talk about the section of literacy. Oftentimes when we talk about literacy, we think strictly about our ability to read and write. But I want to make sure to push you all listening to me today to think a little bit more about literacy in terms of numeral, numerical literacy, as well as the fluency of your language to read in English and write in English, which are two different things. So literacy and language here are very linked for us. When I talk about numerical literacy, 
it's really important to understand that for some people who have chronic diseases like diabetes and high blood pressure, do they really understand the numbers and the calculations necessary to control their chronic disease? We often don't think to ask that question. We just go in and think we all have the same level of understanding, and it's not always the case, which again can be a huge determinant of how we manage the disease, but not only that, it's a huge determinant of whether we have chronic disease or not. Food is a huge issue. Food access, whether you are able to access the food that you need, the healthy options that are, are, uh, are there healthy options available or not, and then are you able to actually access enough food to control whether you have hunger or not. These are two other big issues that we often hear as big drivers to health here in Connecticut, but also around the world. And most times we see all of the commercials about what's happening in third world countries, but we often don't think domestically, right here in our own backyard, what's happening in terms of people's communities and their access to care, uh, access to healthy food. One big example here that a lot of people do not know, there is not a major grocery store option for people living in the north end of Hartford. Most people don't know this. There are also sections of Bridgeport, Connecticut where there is not a major grocery store. So people have to rely on public transportation or mid-sized grocers or bodegas which don't carry a lot of fresh fruit options because of the flow of their business for their food. This again is a huge determinant of how we are able to manage our care, manage our health, but also the, our risk factors related to health. These last two get a little bit tricky, but are really, really important. The community and social context, which could be linked to your neighborhood and environment, but it is a little different. How socially integrated are you? What support systems you have? How engaged are you in your community? And do you face on a daily or regular basis any form of discrimination related to any of your identities? These are all really crucial and critical determinants of health. We often hear the flip side of this called resiliency. We tend to look at how resilient individuals and or communities are in dealing with the issues that are in their communities, but we often have to look a little bit deeper and think about how integrated and connected they are to their community and to people around them. I always like to give an aging example here because we tend to think about how lovely it is to get to a point in our life that we can retire and we can not have to work day to day. But what we often miss here are the things that come to come to be in a lot of people's lives in their elder like elder part of their life when they're able to retire because they're no longer socially integrated into the work system, the workflow, or the daily life. This is also true for people in rural communities where it's very difficult to connect often and frequently to your neighbor because of the distance between you. And the last social determinant here is the actual healthcare system. Now before I go into it, I want to pause and make sure we all recognize that I've just gone through five domains that are social determinants of health and not one of them deal with the healthcare system itself. This links back to the prior slide where it's important to understand 40% of the things that drive our health and the drivers of our health outcomes are not things linked in the healthcare system. But the healthcare system is still very, very important because even if we solve for all of the things to the left of the healthcare system domain, there still is the question of what happens to you and what's available to you within the healthcare system. Do you have health coverage? And are you able to link to and find the provider that you need at the time that you need it? Are those providers able to give you culturally and linguistically competent uh, services and care at the time that you need it and in the place that you need it? And then even if my favorite, favorite phrase, even if you have the insurance card and you have access to the doctor and you can find the right doctor at the right time, are you actually getting the quality of care necessary to get you to your best and optimal health? Now, before we leave the slide, it's important that I don't ignore everything in the orange. As I stated at the top of the slide, any of these domains could be individual determinants of your health, but they also operate collectively to look at all of those things that happen in that orange part of the slide mortality, morbidity, your life expectancy, any of your healthcare expenditures, your health status, and your functional ability to, uh, uh, your functional ability in our country, uh, excuse me, in society. When I talk about life expectancy, it's one thing that I like to note is you could, in Connecticut, 
live on one same street and have two different cities that are on each side of the street. And on one side being a zip code that has a seven year life expectancy difference than on the other side of the street based on any one of these social determinants that are above. This is critical to understanding health. So as I get ready to conclude, I never like to leave anybody without any information about what you can do about it. Thus far, I've explained what health equity is, why it's important and why it matters, and an expanded definition of health and how the social determinants of health impact and influence each of our individual health. It's important to understand now that you know it, what can you do with this? So I ask you to pay attention to systemic issues that have to continue to impact individuals. If you are a healthcare provider, it's not enough to just try to get somebody's acute situation fixed, but look a little bit deeper about where they live, what their home life might be like, and what places and ways you can connect them to services that help influence their health and get them to a better health status. I often tell providers, if I am homeless, you can try to con correct my asthma all you want to, but if I'm not in a home that is safe, in an environment that is healthy, I am gonna continuously show up at your door with an issue related to my chronic disease. We can all work together to improve health by considering all the factors that impact health. And you don't have to be a healthcare provider to do this. As an advocate, as a person who lives in any community, you can advocate for systemic change within and outside of the institutions you work in, live in, play in, go to school in, wherever it is. We like to talk about this as advocacy from the place where you sit. Think about where and how you can influence the system to make sure that all people in Connecticut have an opportunity for their best health and that we are able to address the social determinants of health as well as the acute care issues that come up. And lastly, we ask you to advocate for health equity and we remind you here that this is a redistribution of health resources. We don't believe this is a conversation about taking anything away and someday when maybe we're flush with cash, we can talk about adding resources to the system. But right now, I think there's a lot of work we can do by thinking a lot differently about how we allocate our current resources and what we need to do. Often I say, if we can correct the system for the least of these, meaning the most disenfranchised in our system, we've helped everybody get to their optimal health. And lastly, because we talk about unapologetically race and ethnic populations, we say fight for racial justice. This means don't ignore the influences of the criminal justice system, our education system, and our huge educational gap in Connecticut around how this impacts the health and opportunities for people in Connecticut in the future. So remember I said I wanted you to remember that equity, equality slide. I just gonna, I'm gonna put here for a moment the first two pieces of this again. I'm not gonna go over them. We've already talked about what equality looks like and we talked about what equity looks like. But there's one big thing we forgot to discuss in both of these pictures, and that's the fence. This last picture lets us know that ultimately where we need to go is liberation, where there isn't a barrier at all for any person in Connecticut in obtaining their optimal health. And not only are they able to fully participate in being healthy and fully participate in their own health care, health decisions, and life choices, but that there isn't anything stopping them from being happy, healthy, and all of us living in one equitable Connecticut. I thank you for listening today, and that concludes my portion of the webinar, but I will give you a little commercial break. Here is our slide and our information about Health Equity Solutions, our website, and our social media. You are always welcome to connect with us and partner with us for webinar and training opportunities just like today. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you. Thank you so much, Takesha. I really appreciate not just the uh, depth of your presentation, but I hope that our participants uh, were able to get a lot out of it and further feel inspired to do something about uh, health equity and the social determinants of health. You may be wondering in any way that um, why um, Access Health Connecticut is presenting a webinar uh, on health equity and the social determinants of health. And I would point to you, I don't have it in one of the slides, but the mission statement of Access Health Connecticut actually includes uh, reducing health inequities as one of its most important priorities. And that is the reason why we're happy to present webinars like today. 
Now, let me wear a different hat a little bit for a moment so that you can also have a breather, Takesha, and uh, talk a little bit about Access Health Connecticut and our involvement with all of our community partners. We are always looking for organizations and groups and even neighborhood groups to join us as community partners. Community partners share information about access to health coverage with communities all over Connecticut. Access Health Connecticut provides resources and invites dialogue with our partners. And we have right now many community partners that include, I don't have to read them all, but include community health centers, uh, educational institutions, hospitals, libraries, faith organizations, and many more. So for that reason, I'd love to show you, I love to show this map in particular because it shows the effort that Access Health Connecticut has put into establishing community partners and we are not done yet. We want to see every corner of the state of Connecticut be aware of the work of Access Health Connecticut and be able to partner with us to get health and um, health insurance accessible to everyone. Partner engagement includes things that you can be helpful to Access Health Connecticut with, such as uh, having us uh, speak at events, informational or training sessions. We have an entire outreach team that can table at your events or events in your community. So we're constantly asking our partners to suggest events that we should be present, that we should be to, there to provide information to the public. We host educational webinars like today, and of course, I really like to point out this website. For anyone in the audience today who has not yet been able to use this as a resource, please check out learn.accesshealthct.com forward slash community. This website offers information about events, it links you to our monthly newsletter, it shows you printable educational materials and contact information. And of course, last but not least, Access Health Connecticut is constantly providing materials that can be distributed to the community. Other ways that you can help, we don't necessarily have to uh, review every single one of them, but we can provide a poster that can be made visible to your clients. We can provide uh, brochures that can be made available. Uh, you can link Access Health Connecticut to your website. You can share with your email list. And of course, we are very active on social media and we love our partners to join us there. Engaging with the community things that we can do for you. We can come to your speaking engagements, provide the engagements ourselves. We attend local state events, fairs, festivals. We provide educational webinars, informational materials, research and surveys, and planning sessions. Here is the best way to contact the outreach team at Access Health Connecticut. Note this email, outreach at accesshealthct.com. And if you also go to the community website that I mentioned a slide before, uh, you can also contact us through there. Any communication through this email will get directly to the outreach team so that we can get back to you as quickly as possible and make arrangements to provide you and your clients with the necessary information. Here's a couple more resources. Again, the community website, I can't sell it enough. I think it's a wonderful resource. Uh, you can search for in-person help for your clients by going to support.accesshealthct.com. Uh, we hope that you are signed up for our newsletter if you are not yet. You can do that right through the community website and of course, continue to participate in our educational webinars. Big announcement for this year. We are about to have, we are in the planning uh, process uh, to hold our 2018 community conference. I want you to save this date and participate with us. Friday, October 19th of this year, we will be at the Red Lion Hotel in Cromwell. And the way for you to sign up and RSVP that you're coming is the link that we have here ahct-cc-2018 on eventbrite.com. Uh, we'll be happy to uh, post this link anywhere uh, again so that you can access it. But we have already had two very successful uh, conferences where all of our community partners have been able to come together and talk about so many of the issues that affect our clients and our consumers in Connecticut. All right, so if anyone in the audience is part of a group 
an organization that has yet to become a community partner, reach out to us. You can call, call the number here, 860-327-5517. That number, again, goes right and directly to the Access Health Connecticut Outreach Team. You can email us at outreach at accesshealthct.com. Don't forget to go to the website and, of course, follow Access Health CT on all of the social media. Alrighty, then let's get ready to do some questions. And, uh, you know, Takesha, I'd like this to be a conversation um, with our participants. And to let everyone know, we have requested of people who uh, RSVP uh, whether they had any questions in advance, and we may have some questions that people uh, are asking right now. Uh, oh, one of the first questions I have is very easy. Can we receive the slides of the webinar? And the answer, I'll answer it, is absolutely yes. The best way to do it is, remember that website I keep repeating? Learn that access health CT forward slash community. At that website, you can obtain and actually view all of the webinars that Access Health Connecticut has uh, presented. So if you give us a couple of days, you will be able to see this very one and download it as well, so you can have the slides. Um, let's see, any other questions? Um, Takesha, can you expand for us on the concept that your zip code can determine your health outcomes? Give us an example. I know that you did that in your presentation a little bit, but uh, uh, we have a, a participant who's very interested in that concept. Absolutely. So there has been for a while the saying that your zip code can dictate your health more than your genetic code. And what that's really influencing and showing you is that dependent upon where you live, that slide where we walk through the environment, the neighborhood, your income, all of those things really dictate your access and opportunities to optimal health. So one example here is right in Hartford and West Hartford on the West Hartford Hartford line. You could live on one side of that line and have a life expectancy on average of 78 years of age. And just across the street on the same side, on the same street, just over the line in Hartford, it drops down by anywhere from eight to 10 years. So what is that rooted in and what does that look like? It's about the resources and the opportunities that are different in each of those cities and towns. Now, I wanna stop here and say, it doesn't mean that something is wrong or bad about any city or town. It's just really about what are the design opportunity, the design and opportunities that exist there. So if you look at any particular zip code, what are, the, what are the access to healthy food options? Where's the nearest hospital? Or how many physicians or providers are in that particular area? What are the hours of their, oper of their um, operations? So one of the things that we've learned while we've been talking to a lot of different community members is there are some uh, safety net options in particular neighborhoods that aren't open at night. So you may not have access to a provider. And let's pause and talk about the reality of that. For many people who work during the day, they really rely on access to providers in either urgent care facilities or in clinics. And those are not necessarily always off open in the time and hours that are available for people. So when you start to break down what's happening in zip codes, you can ask and look at those questions. What are the availability of jobs? What's the availability of housing? What's the availability of food and other different, of all of those social determinants of health? And that can dictate what's happening or give you a good predictor of health in that community. Excellent, thank you, thank you. I have a couple more questions I wanna ask you on behalf of our participants. But before I do that, let me point everyone to the chat um, uh, box because our colleague posted a survey monkey link that I would really, really, truly appreciate everyone link into, uh, click on and fill out. The reason for that survey monkey is basically so you can let us know the value of this webinar. Is it helpful to you? Is it not? Is, is there any feedback that you would really like to share with us? It is very important to us to know what your experience has been because it helps us improve all further uh, offerings to our webinars. So again, go to the chat box, see where it says, please take a moment to fill out our quick survey and click on that link. Uh, before I will leave it up actually uh, even after a little bit after the webinar is complete so that you can give us your feedback. We would really appreciate it. So Takesha, I'm wondering if anyone in our 
um, participants may have already known that um, you and Health Equity Solutions uh, is very knowledgeable and has been a part of policy making regarding community health workers because we have a couple of questions on community health workers. All right. Can you tell us really quick, first of all, what is a community health worker? Sure, so community health workers are public health frontline workers who work in communities to help those communities navigate healthcare and healthcare systems and also the social services that might be available to them that can get them to their op optimal health. In a short version, we believe, though not um, sufficient, but very necessary, that community health workers are a key link to getting people to their optimal health. And we say that because community health workers often have one or two characteristics that are really important. They are, they are almost always from the community in which they're trying to help, so they have a deeply rooted understanding of that community. And that means not only just this is kind of every definition of community. So the physical realm of the geographic area, but it also has the kind of ethnic ethnicity, sociocultural equivalent side of that community as well. And they often have either, um, in addition to that, or the big thing is they might have a shared experience with whatever the chronic disease or chronic issue is that a person may have. So for us, we see them as a critical aspect of health equity because they're really able to go beyond the walls of a doctor's office or a hospital and find out what's going on. And I often tell my story of how when I had asthma as a young kid, or when, I still do, but when I was troubled in trying to get to the diagnosis of asthma and how to get to the right care plan, if I had a community health worker who came to our home, a lot of those pictures I showed on the Bobby example, mm -hmm. they would have noticed some of those things were there. And that might not have been the best place for a kid who's trying to navigate uh, asthma and get to a really good plan. So we find that community health workers are very critical and are essential. And it's why we chose to, um, as one of our first policy initiatives, work on making sure that community health workers are recognized in the state of Connecticut and are better integrated into our system of healthcare. And Health Equity Solutions, I understand, was able to champion uh, the legislation last year. Yes, we uh, did. And get it passed. <laughs> so absolutely, congratulations. Yes. And uh, of course, as I said, we do nothing without partnerships. So we were um, a lead entity in doing that work, but had a number of partners with us um, at our side. So we are thankful to them. That's how you get policy done. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so someone in relation to the community health worker is asking us, uh, what is the status of the community health worker cert certifications in Connecticut? Oh, we got some really sad participants listening yeah. today, so I'm excited to talk about this. So last year, um, Health Equity Solutions, with a number of partners, just to go a little bit more in depth in this, passed, um, worked to pass Senate Bill 126, which became Public Act 1774, which started the process of defining, it defined into statute what a community health worker was, and then started the process of the state innovation models community health worker advisory group examining the feasibility of certification in the state of Connecticut. So that report is due out on October 1st, and any day now we'll get a draft report of that coming out of the SIMS um, CSW advisory work group, and Health Equity Solutions will ask everybody to comment on it, but in that report it'll be recommendations about what certification should look like in Connecticut, who should be the certifying entity, and what are the requirements for certification going forward. Now, this isn't the final step, because even once we have that, there'll need to be, there needs to be legislative and possibly administrative action to move it forward, but this is a critical move for us in Connecticut towards making sure that our community health workers we have now and the future ones who are being educated at the community colleges here are very able, and not only educated through the community colleges but have been doing this work for a number of years regardless of whether they have education or not um, are able to be really recognized in our system and are able to help us move further in advancing health equity in the state so thank you for the question i'm excited to talk about that terrific excellent all right the last question i have that was submitted uh ahead of time is a little bit on the general terms but it touches on exactly what access health connecticut is trying to accomplish and what we are all about so we had the question that says, how can we better expand health insurance coverage to low-income populations? Nice, okay. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a doozy. Okay, so how can we better expand health insurance to, to low-income populations? Well, I think a few things that are really, really critical and um, 
this is, I, I want to highlight and say Health Equity Solutions is a nonpartisan organization. So I think all of our solutions are solutions that any person who's involved in any political party or any political tent could really take up. And so to, in answer to your question, I would say we need to make sure that some of the protections in the Affordable Care Act that help um, provide subsidies to individuals who can't afford health insurance on their own remain in place. Um, that we continuously think about where we are right now in Connecticut and making decisions around our Medicaid and who's eligible for Medicaid. And I highlight that one particularly because Connecticut has been a leader in health innovation in a number of ways. And especially we were one of the first marketplaces to exist and Access Health is like an amazing partner. Um, but we have to be mindful overall in our policy decisions that We've gone to now somewhere, depending on who's telling us the number, between four and six percent on insurance rate. And so we're at that point where we are now at the most fragile individuals to get, in, to get insurance. But if we start taking people off of Medicaid, we have to be thinking about where they're going to go and how they're going to afford insurance. And we have a lot of protections and a lot of opportunities within Access Health. But we firmly believe at Health Equity Solutions that'll leave some people out of the door. And so we have to make sure that we're making collective decisions about healthcare insurance, understanding that Medicaid is coverage mm -hmm. and how we connect that to other insurance options. And then lastly, I think making sure that people are aware of their, of, of their um, ability to get access to healthcare regardless of what their employer options are. Because often there's a mishap and a mislink that if my employer doesn't have insurance, then I can't get it. And that's a really interesting um, factor that's come up to me in recent in recent months where people don't know that they're eligible to just go to access health and find out what they're what they're eligible for what they can afford and actually get a plan they think they have to wait for their employer to do something so I think that you should just continue to do your great outreach and really promote um, in some of the in some of the usual and unusual places to make sure people have voices and then of course you don't need to hear this from me, but we all know about the barbershops and the hair salons. Yes. Making sure that they know, because they should be talking about this too in terms of their clients and making sure everybody has access to help. Absolutely, and that's a great example. I'm really happy that you ended that, that answer uh, with the, the barbershops and the beauty salons. Uh, access Health Connecticut has continued to, in its outreach efforts, uh, you know, to work our best to reach deeper and deeper into the communities, and we know we're very well aware of the fact that we need to go to where people are, and that's very much a part of how we design uh, our outreach efforts. So, all right, very good. So with that, I don't have any other questions that people have posted. I will point out the link to our survey and ask you, or no, beg you to give us your feedback. It really, truly is important to us. So go to the chat box and click on the link for the Survey Monkey, it will take you about a minute uh, and it will help us provide better and better content as we move along with our webinars and other presentations that Access Health Connecticut provides. And then lastly, I want to give a big thank you to, to Keisha for being such a wonderful presenter. Uh, your organization, Health Equity Solutions, is a fantastic partner and I think that this education needs to get into the hands of so many people. So we're very proud to be able to provide this uh, through Access Health Connecticut. And last but not least, a big thank you to our participants. We really appreciate that you've taken the time to join us for this webinar. Look for more. Be sure to go to my famous website, the community website, learn.accesshealthct.com forward slash community and look for our announcements of further webinars and other events that we are involved in. So with that, I will bid you all goodbye and have a uh, hope that you have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. And once again, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. I will leave the link up for an extra minute for anyone that may have not linked on it and give us our feedback. But with that, we will end the webinar. Thank you so much. <laughs>